You can start. Okay, very good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you, Shield, right at the start for giving me this opportunity to share some views about uh, the a holistic approach of uh, PCOS. So uh, now I'd like to have the slides on the screen. So, you know, all of us know that uh, you know, PCOS is a very, com very common condition. Initially, we were not uh, so aware of it, but since we have become aware of it, and uh, we know that uh, it could be in the lean patients, it could be in the obese patients, it could be in adolescents, it could be in the reproductive age, and even perimenopausal. We find uh, patients in that group also, because this is not a disease, it is a syndrome complex, which extends throughout life, and it has a bearing, a long-term bearing on the whole life. And even not, in, uh, not only in this life, in the patient, but even in the coming generation because of the in utero programming. So now I'll be uh, dividing uh, the talk into background, the definition and prevalence, issues related to PCOS and approach to management. Next. So in 1935, Stain uh, Leventon, uh, they designated PCOS as a syndrome. 80 to 90s, we saw that uh, there was an addition of ultrasound criteria to it. And in 2003, Rotterdam Consensus Conference happened. And then it was, uh, uh, there was the Rotterdam criteria, which was labeled for diagnosing patients of PCOS. In 2018, international evidence-based guideline for the assessment and management of PCOS uh, was declared. Next slide, please. So, uh, to introduce, PCOS is not merely a reproductive disorder, but an endocrinological disorder affecting women in their reproductive years, extending into their whole life. Although hyperandrogenism and infertility but, uh, that uh, PCOS causes are distressing to the young woman, its metabolic sequelae eventually plague the individual in terms of morbidity and mortality. Next, please. Next slide, please. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah. So uh, uh, ultrasound, uh, you see that uh, the, there are ultrasound parameters, uh, the previous slide, please. That shows that uh, you should have at least, say, nine, uh, 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 yes, two to nine, the PCOS in those. Uh, initially, we had that uh, there was a criteria of uh, nine to 10 or 12 uh, follicles, but now the criteria is 20. So it should not be, uh, the ultrasound should not be used only for diagnosis of PCOS in those patients. Uh, who are less than eight years of age, because from uh, eight, eight, around two to three years from Menaki, the patient is already um, uh, anabulatory. And uh, so she has um, irregular cycles, especially oligomenorrhea. And one of the features of PCOS is oligomenorrhea. So we should not confuse it with that. And due to the high incidence of uh, multiple cysts in the ovaries in, the, in, the, in this phase of life, so ultrasound is not used as a diagnostic tool for diagnosing uh, uh, PCOS in patients who are less than eight years from enough. Next slide, please. So you see, there are three components, basically. They are the, gyne and, uh, the gynecological ones, in which irregular menstruation and infertility are uh, uh, clumped. The metabolic one, in which insulin resistance, obesity, increased chances of type 2 diabetes mellitus, acanthosis migrans is there and the androgenic uh, group in which there's alopecia, hirsutism, and acne. They could all be combined together, like we can see here in the uh, Rotterdam criteria. Hyperandrogenism, either clinical or biochemical, may be present. Oligoanovulation may be present. Polycystic appearance of the ovaries may be present, all three of them. But according to the NIH criteria, they should, uh, the hyperandrogenism and oligoanovulation should be present and PCOS ovaries could be present. In the androgen excess uh, the society, they say that uh, there should be present uh, hyperandrogenism along with one or two of the remaining criteria. That means hyperandrogenism is a must and oligoandrovulation or 
polycystic ovaries may be associated with it one or both next slide so according to that uh, uh, the phenotypes of pcos have been classified hyperandrogenism and uh, hirsutism oligoovulatory uh, dysfunction and polycystic ovaries by my morphology all these are present in phenotype a in phenotype b hyperandrogenism oligo dysfunction or uh, anovulatory dysfunction and uh, those two are present but uh, the polycystic ovaries are absent in the phenotype c hyperandrogenism is present and the polycystic ovaries are present but they may not be ovulatory dysfunction and in phenotype d hyperandrogenism is absent but oligo uh, the ovulatory dysfunction and uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome that is present so you see there are varied uh, phenotypes of uh, pcos syndrome only next slide in these two four types the phenotype b is the one which is difficult uh, for ovulation induction because of the hyperandrogenism here we can see why in utero there are epigenetic changes genetic variants occur and in a drug uh, adrenarche inflammatory factors and environmental exposures now we all know that edc that is environmental disrupting factors are considered as one of the causes of uh, you know pcos in adolescence ex lack of exercise activity hormone exposure and uh, the ectopic fat uh, storage especially in the abdominal fat all these are present the adrenal factors they are present in adolescence in adult to uh, adulthood there is androgen excess ovarian factors insulin secretion um, uh, is there and insulin insensitivity is there insulin secretion is present but there is a defect at the receptor level and in pregnancy neuroendocrine factors and of course diet and uh, cns programming that uh, adds to it so during pregnancy the pcos patient should be very careful about what they are eating because if there is obesity and uh, there is uh, insulin resistance then this is trans translated into the baby and uh, the babies of pcos mothers are found to be pcos uh, girls next slide please so here basically we can see uh, what is the pathophysiology the basic pathophysiology is in the insulin resistance the insulin is being secreted but at the cellular level it is not bioavailable because of the phosphorylation defect at the you know, re receptor level and uh, uh, when there is a increased amount of insulin resistance it leads to uh, uh, hyperandrogenism and uh, dhes increased from the the lh is increased because of its action on the uh, the gnrh that uh, increases the amplitude and frequency of pulsatility and that leads to increased amount of lh which leads to increased amount of uh, secretion of the uh, hydroepinephrine uh, and testosterone in the uh, ovaries in the pica cells and from there the aromatase enzyme converts it to estrogen so there is basically a hyper estrogenic state a tonic estrogen state and uh, this leads to hyperplasia of the endometrium and uh, difficulty in ovulation next slide please in the liver the uh, the secretion of uh, the lh that also leads to increase the insulin resistance causes increase uh, amount of uh, uh, the, the sex hormone binding globulin that is decreased so that leads to increased amount of free testosterone leading to increased amount of hyperandrogenism so here the controls lh levels insulin is primarily res uh, uh, responsible for controlling the insulin is primarily responsible for controlling the lh controls uh, androgenism and insulin uh, med uh, the uh, analogs they uh, cause production in the uh, increase the production in the theca cells insulin resistance Coexists in PCOD, and women with PCOS have decreased sensitivity to circulating insulin, irrespective of the weight, that is obesity, thus suggesting that this insulin insensitivity is intrinsic to PCOS. Inositol deficiency drives PCOD. This insulin resistance seems to be driven by a deficiency of myositol and dikyrositol. So, myositol deficiency triggers. disrupted insulin signaling that is how it causes insulin dysfunction and disrupts the lh fsh pathways and leads to hyperandrogenism as we have seen because of increased lh because of reduced sex hormone binding globulins from the liver and that leads to increased free testosterone next slide please 
So what are the complications of PCOS basically? Uh, these patients may come directly with uh, the complaints of infertility. Primary infertility was reported in 50% of women. Secondary infertility was reported in 25%. Three times higher risk of preeclampsia was seen, three times higher risk of GDN, and two-fold increase in preterm and IUGR tendencies. There was in the cardiovascular system, two-fold increase in the risk of MI, two-fold increased risk of hypertension, and in these patients, the uh, metabolic syndrome that is seen to happen in later ages, and five to ten fold increase is seen uh, in the risk, of, uh, there's a risk of developing of uh, type 2 diabetes in these patients. And oncology, increased risk of endometrial carcinoma is there, as we've already seen. There's an increase in the uh, level of uh, the estrogen, so it is a hyperestrogenic state, and therefore, unopposed action of estrogen leads to endometrial hyperplasia and increased risk of endometrial carcinoma. There's a fourfold increase in the depressive symptoms, high prevalence of anxiety disorders, reduced quality of life. So these are the general complications that we see in the uh, PCOS patients. Next slide, please. So there are lifestyle changes and uh, the hormonal changes. There is a genetic influence. It's been seen that the SIP 11 uh, and 17 uh, pathways the, uh, in the, um, the locations in the uh, chromosomes, they are found to be a common error in cases of diabetes mellitus as well as in patients of hyperandrogenism. So it's one of a genetic pathway which is common to both. So that leads to increased amount of androgens, hirsutism, and uh, uh, obesity exacerbates the hormonal changes because of a lack of leptin, and uh, there is metabolism of these uh, hormones in the fat too, increasing the amount of free testosterone. So there is increased insulin diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and the cardiovascular risk as we've already seen. These lead to ovarian follicles being um, recruited, which are not, uh, uh, which are not uh, becoming dominant, and that leads to anovulation, and there is increased amount of estrogen. Menstrual disturbances are a sequelae of that. Psychological um, uh, changes because of the uh, body image, the slow self-esteem, and depression and anxiety are in some patients with uh, gross hyperandrogenism, some cases anecdotal cases of suicide have also been seen. Next slide, please. So the prevalence of metabolic syndrome with PCOS is approximately 43 to 46% according to WHO. Type two diabetes, insulin, uh, reduce uh, in, uh, uh, this, um, insulin glucose tolerance and uh, or insulin resistance or plus more than two of the following. That is BMI more than 30 kgs per meter square. That is high, uh, um, uh, the height, the weight uh, by height in meter square. And HDL less than one millimoles per liter. That is equivalent to less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. Triglycerides more than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Blood pressure more than 140 by 90 or the use of blood pressure medication. And microalbuminuria more than 20 picograms per minute. Albumin creatinine ratio, more than 30. These factors, when present, are indicators of a metabolic syndrome. Next slide, please. Insulin resistance is the major underlying pathophysiological abnormality linking the metabolic syndrome and PCOS. Weight loss, therefore, with lifestyle changes, modification is the safest and cheapest therapy that has shown benefit both in metabolic syndrome and in PCOS. Next slide, please. So what are the cardiovascular disease association? Uh, uh, what is the association with it? Women with polycystic ovarian syndrome are at increased cardiovascular risk. Given the high prevalence of metabolic syndrome X, stronger evidence between an increased risk of cardiovascular events in women with menstrual irregularities has been seen. The existing data suggests that PCOS adversely affects or accelerates the development of an adverse cardiovascular risk profile and atherosclerosis. Next slide, please. So PCOS disease uh, syndrome, specific questionnaires are given, known as the PCO, PCOSQs, and has been, uh, they have been developed to study the psychopathology in these women. Obesity and infertility cause the greatest degree of stress. Both in anorexia nervosa and bilimina have been linked with PCOS. You may find PCOS not only in obese patients and even 
uh, lean pa uh, patients. Now, many conditions that coexist with PCOS, such as pelvic pain, depression, and altered mood. Next slide, please. So uh, you can see that uh, the this, uh, we have seen that uh, studies have been done, uh, which have tested the thickness of the intima media thickness as a surrogate for cardiovascular evaluation. And they have shown the potential of increased cardiovascular risk in women with PCOS. Coronary artery calcification in PCOS has been seen. A similar study using coronary artery calcification at risk stratification has shown increased risk in patients with PCOS. Sleep apnea and other sleep disorders. Multiple groups have documented an increased risk for sleep apnea and other sleep disorders, including increased daytime somnolence, <clears throat> such as sleep disorder breathing in women with PCOS. And we all know that sleep apnea leads to hypoxia, which is uh, not good for the brain. Uh, next slide, please. So with, uh, uh, as far as uh, its relation with carcinoma is concerned, it has been seen that endometrial hyperplasia with or without ATPA is seen in women and it varies from 1 to 48.8%. Chronic anovulation, which results in continuous estrogen, stimulates the endometrium by, because of its unopposed action uh, without progesterone. Obesity, hyperinsulinemia, and hyperandrogenism state in PCOS results in an increased bioavailability of unopposed estrogens by, uh, uh, due to the increased peripheral conversion of endogenous androgen into estrogen. Women with PCOS had a 2.4 increased risk of developing ovarian cancer. One of the reasons is that these patients are infertile and therefore uh, the regular breakdown of the epithelium of the ovary occurs. And wherever there is a metaplasia, a rapid turnover of cells, carcinoma is more likely. Moreover, it has been seen that in these patients when they use gonadotropin high doses for a long time, have multiple cycles, in those patients there's an increased risk of ovarian carcinoma. Clomiphene citrate and gonadotropin therapy or ovulation induction was found to increase the relative risk of ovarian tumors in women with PCOS. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, in pregnancy, multiple pregnancies are more impo most important cause of the increased perinatal morbidity observed following fertility treatments. When there are fertility treatments, now it, uh, uh, usually we have a single embryo transfer, people are aiming at it, but still we still have multiple pregnancies because of ART. Miscarriage, it is still debated whether women with PCOS have an increased risk of miscarriage. Pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia have definitely been seen to be three to four-fold times uh, uh, higher than in these patients than in normal patients. Next slide, please. So uh, what is associated with gestational diabetes? It is increased by 3% of pregnancies overall. There are two to four-fold increased risks of GDM among PCOS women, independent of the race, ethnicity, multiple gestations. GDM complicates 40 to 50% of PCOS pregnancies, and PCOS and hypertensive disorders in pregnancy have been seen to be associated. Hypertensive disorders occurs in 8% of PCOS pregnancies. Increased levels of androgens in PCOS have been associated with the development of preeclampsia. Next slide, please. So you see factors increasing the risk of severe uh, uh, COVID-19, like you have, we all know that obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, these are comorbidities, patients with metabolic syndrome, and, uh, and uh, these have been seen to be associated with increased risk of COVID-19 also. There's high cytokine levels, high androgen levels, and low vitamin D level. These factors increase the cardiometabolic risk in PCOS patients. Next slide, please. So what are the treatment aims? To restore the natural, spontaneous menstrual cycle, reduce the androgen levels, and especially, uh, especially important in patients of hyperandrogenism, these are adolescent patients with low self-esteem and they have not come for treatment of infertility. They, have, um, uh, they may be coming for this reason or because they have had hyperandrogenemia and these uh, effects on the, the, the hirsutism. And uh, you know, some of them may be coming for obesity, overcome insulin resistance and to improve the oocyte maturation and oocyte quality in patients who are infertile. Next slide, please. So... The management basically hovers around lifestyle modifications. The first, this is the first, first line of treatment. 
improvement in lifestyle, not taking too much carbohydrates, fatty foods, burgers, pizzas, all these other and the cold drinks, all these increase have a high calorie value and they add to the obesity. In obese patients, weight loss changes in diet and physical activity is recommended. Weight loss decreases serum insulin, androgen levels reduces the risk of glucose tolerance, intolerance, and type 2 diabetes. Pharmacological interventions in the presence of insulin resistance or glucose intolerance or dyslipidemia that persist after lifestyle modifications are to be treated. Next slide, please. So the patient does not wish to conceive. Medical therapy is directed to uh, interruption of the effect of an opposed action of estrogen on the endometrium. Not fluctuating, non-fluctuating levels of unopposed estradiol in the absence of progesterone, least irregular uterine bleeding, amenorrhea, infertility, and then increased risk of endometrial cancer. OCPs elevate the risk of CVD. All of us know that. That is why it is contraindicated in cardiac patients, and they cause dyslipidemia and increased chance of thromboembolic events. There are evidences suggesting increased risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus with OCPs usage, and this effect can be dose dependent. A low dose over oral contraceptive pill is therefore recommended. Next slide, please. So there's a, a, when the, the patient comes for treatment of uh, hirsutism, cyproteron acetate is given. There's a weak evidence of dose 25 to 100 milligrams twice a day is uh, in titrated uh, is in the treatment of, and the efficacy while avoiding side effects such as orthostatic hypotension and uh, uh, it, it may take six months or more. It can cause uh, and uh, exacerbate hyperkalemia. Spironolactone should be used cautiously in women with renal impairment. Rarely exposure has uh, exposure has resulted in ambiguous genital uh, ambiguous genitalia in male infants. Next slide, please. So that is why if there, there's any chance of a pregnancy, do not use it. Cyproterin acetate, that is a progesterone with anti-androgen properties. It is combined with an oral, oral contraceptive tablet and is popular in the treatment. When given in 100 milligram daily doses, it inhibits testosterone production, resulting in up to 75% uh, uh, reduction in the uh, circulating testosterone levels. Glutamide, it is an androgen receptor antagonist and is another non-steroidal anti-androgen. The most common side effects is dry skin, but its use has been associated with hepatitis. This is one of its main uh, uh, disadvantages and uh, complications. The common dosage is 250 milligrams per day. The risk of teratogenicity with this compound is significant and contraception should be used. Finasteride inhibitor of type two uh, alpha reductase enzyme found in the hair follicles on the top of the scalp and in the sebaceous gland ducts better tolerated than other antiandrogens with minimum hep hepatic and renal toxicity. However, it like spironolactone, you have to be careful when you're giving uh, in, uh, in uh, renal cases and uh, uh, flutamide in cases of uh, hepatic uh, involvement. But uh, this has a low toxicity on those, uh, both of them. However, it has well-documented risk for teratogenicity and feminizing in a male fetus. Next slide, please. Now, ornithine decarboxylase inhibitors. Ornithine decarboxylase enzyme is necessary, and in, in the inhibition of this enzyme limits the cell division in the phyllosebaceous unit. So, therefore, efloritine has been uh, found to be effective as a facial treatment and unwanted facial hair. It is pregnancy category C drug. It appears to be well tolerated with only about 2% of patients developing skin irritation or adverse reactions. Relapse is common after stopping. So studies suggest myonositol at 4 gram dosage, the dosage is important, in powder formulation can tackle hirsutism without any side effects. Next slide, please. So uh, what are the medical ovulation induction uh, drugs? The recommended first-line treatment for ovulation induction remains the anti-estrogen clomiphene citrate. It acts at the hypothalamic level, pituitary, and at the ovarian level. Recommended second-line intervention uh, is usually now, uh, now letrozole is coming up as a first line of treatment because it leads to monofollicular development and less chances of OHSS, and it does not affect the uh, cervical mucus, and therefore, uh, and the endometrium is also not thinned out. 
So recommended uh, second line after that intervention is the exogenous gonadotropins. Now, in strong evidence confirmed the efficacy of inositols in restoring the fertility in PCOHS patients. Now, ovarian drilling LOD that is now considered in lean uh, PCOS patients only when they do not respond. Uh, and this is, and that is basically to reduce the amount of um, the androgen in the ovaries and the follicular fluid. So this is primarily recommended in infertility therapy. Multiple pregnancy rates are reduced in those women who conceive following laparoscopic drilling. In some cases, the fertility benefits of ovarian drilling may be temporary and adjuvant therapy after drilling with clomiphen may be necessary. Ovarian drilling does not appear to improve metabolic abnormalities in women with PCOD. There's a rule of four, that means you know, four millimeters deep, four holes, and four you know, 40 watts. So only that much should be used. Otherwise, you destroy the ovarian stroma and the follicles. Next slide, please. So clomiphene citrate, you start uh, on day two, three, usually that is done on second and third day, but fourth or fifth day also makes no difference, it has been seen. And the dose, uh, 50 milligrams per day, rising by 50 milligrams with no ovulation. Now people have given up uh, starting with a low dose of 50, people generally start with 100 milligrams and increase that by 50 and to a maximum of uh, usually 200. Even without uh, you know, withdrawal bleed, you can start it provided you're sure there's no uh, evidence of pregnancy. Now stopping, when uh, the six ovulatory cycles fail to yield a pregnancy, you should not go on and on. If you see that's three to six cycles maximum, if they do not yield the pregnancy, you have to stop it. When no ovulation with 150 milligrams day, and if uh, endometrial thickness is less than seven uh, millimeter at ovulation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, now aromatase, yes, aromatase inhibitors. Uh, aromatase inhibitors. Now these, uh, this is uh, letrozole, and that is uh, the attacks through inhibiting the enzyme aromatase in the ovary, which converts uh, the repeal to uh, the estrogen. So when you block this, there's less uh, formation of estrogen. This is the basic principle. So do not block estrogen receptors, but they do not go and block the estrogen receptors at the hypothalamus. So that is why there's no detrimental effect on the endometrium or cervical mucus, and negative feedback mechanism is not turned off. This results in less chances of multiple follicular development. And that is why it is preferred in cases of um, uh, PCOS because it uh, reduces the chances of OHSS and it does not affect the um, eastern uh, cervical mucus or the endometrial thickness. Next slide, please. Anastrozole, anastrozole one milligram per day versus uh, clomiphene citrate 100 milligrams per day has been seen. Anastrozole produces fewer uh, follicles, thicker endometrium, and may be used successfully for ovulation induction. Anestrozole, one milligram versus letrozole. Letrozole is superior in ovulation and pregnancy rates. Next slide, please. Now, what is the role of metformin? Metformin, per se, uh, has been seen, has been tried to as an ovulation induction drug, but it has not been seen to produce much um, uh, higher pregnancy rates. So it is used as an adjuvant with clomiphene citrate especially in obese patients. The, uh, so in the presence of metabolic features, you can use it, like BMI, more than 25 kgs per meter square. Insulin sensitizing uh, agent, it is an insulin sensitizing agent, increased but low ovulation frequency, lower conception rate per ovulation and all other, than all other methods. So it cannot be used separately as an ovulation induction drug. If BMI is more than 30, consider metformin in combination with clomiphene citrate may improve response to clomiphene citrate and the uh, uh, debatable reduction in androgenic symptoms is also seen. Next slide, please. So there are some good things and some bad things, and there are some side effects. So sensitizers uh, like metformin, it lowers hyperinsulinemia, that is a good thing about it, and aids in weight loss. But the bad thing about it is that insulin resistance is not seen with all patients with PCOS. So uh, uh, when you give it, there are side effects like uh, uh, they throw up the uh, tablet because many of them have a lot of uh, GI disturbances, platelets, and diarrhea. Oral contraceptives, they might aid in regularizing the reg uh, menstrual cycles. Clinical evidences do not support this claim and aids um, uh, combating hyperandrogenism. But it does not restore ovulation leads to 
uh, accentuated, uh, it uh, increases the, worsens the insulin resistance and it increases CVD risk, increases the risk of thromboembolic events, which is one of the absolute contraindications of COCs. Ovulation induction, in that you see this ovulant inducers, they cause ovulant, uh, ovulation induction definitely, but no effect on any other aspect of PCD, PCOD, not indicated in all PCOS patients because she may, she may have come only for the treatment of, say, hyperandrogenism and increased risk of ovarian cancer and OHSS are, of course, there for pro, after prolonged use. Anti-androgens, for example, flutamide, lower hyperandrogenism, lowers hyperandrogenism, aids in combating hirsutism and virilism. This is its good effect. But the bad side of it is do not tackle insulin resistance and they do not restore fertility, minimal effect on menstrual abnormalities and uh, glutamide-like drugs are very hepatotoxic. Next slide, please. So here, this is basically the current armamentarium that we have for uh, hormonal imbalance, uh, that is hyperandrogenism, LH and FSH imbalance. And uh, this leads to obesity and uh, uh, impaired glucose tolerance. There is uh, acne, hirsutism, virilism, acanthus nigrosum, and uh, there is a lack of uh, the, uh, decrease in ovulation. So what is the metabolic imbalance? That is insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, there are cardiovascular effects, and uh, hypertension. So in the current armamentarium, insulin sensitizers are there like metformin and bioglitazone. In the anti-androgens, we have spironolactone, cipritone acetate, flutamide, and finasteride. Then you have OCPs like oral contraceptives and ovulation induction, induction drugs like uh, CC, letrozole, and esterol. And uh, the, the, we have GTH. Then you have cosmetic uh, improvement uh, methods like laser hair removal and for obesity bariatric surgery. And uh, you have LOD, that is uh, the surgery, which is reserved uh, as the last resort and especially in lean uh, PCOS patients. And we have statins. Next slide, please. So there is infertility because of polycystic ovaries. There's a metabolic syndrome leading to obesity, insulin resistance, and the GnRH pulses, the, uh, uh, the amplitude and the frequency of LH increases. FSS deficiency is there and melatonin Domination, the melatonin, there's a down regulation. So, when there is a, 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 a and then because of that, there is lack of sleep. Now, increased androgen production occurs, and this leads to hyperandrogenemia. There's reduction in the hepatic uh, uh, manufacture of the sex hormone blind binding globulins, and therefore, increased amount of pre testosterone is available. Reduced aromatase activity is there. Again, that leads to increased accumulation of androgens. So here you can see that the glucose, uh, glucose is available, there is uh, insulin, but the uptake uh, is not uh, uh, proper because of the insulin resistance at the receptor level. Next slide, please. So here you have the uh, metformin, what are the pros and cons. Pros are it attacks insulin resistance. There's a wide experience of its use. Cons are that does not prevent GDN, cannot manage severe cases, and it is not tolerated by all. Many of them have severe GI disturbances, and it crosses the placental barrier, fetal placental barrier, and the risks are unknown. It is a category B drug. Now, insulin, the pros are there that it is efficacious. Cons that it has to, it is an injectable form. Hypoglycemia and weight uh, uh, is a definite uh, complication if it is not monitored properly. LGA babies can occur, unable to prevent fetal complications of GDM, and it does not tackle the root cause. Now, inositols. The pros are there that it uh, prevents both GDM and attacks the root cause of GDM, leads to favorable fetal and maternal outcomes. It has been shown to be superior to metformin and to safer both in uh, insulin, uh, it is safer uh, than both insulin and metformin. Next slide, please. So could inositols be considered the treatment of PCOS? Yes, definitely. Next slide. Here you have, see it is found it, uh, in the 
things that we have day in daily uh, food, like it is seen in fruits, in grapefruit, it is the highest, in the vegetables, in leafy vegetables, the lowest, and in all foods containing seeds, like beans, almonds, and walnuts. These are things that we regularly have in our kitchen. Next slide, please. Rhomionositol plays an important role as a secondary messenger in the uh, uh, human multi, and it has uh, multiple factors by which it acts. Next slide, please. Myositol is present in high concentration in ovarian follicular fluid. Myositol is essential for normal reproductive function of the female. High levels of myositol in follicular fluid is very important for follicular growth and oocyte maturation, and we have, as we have seen in the previous diagram, that for the calcium oscill oscillations, it is important for good quality of oocytes. For the maturation of oocytes, it is important. So high levels of myonicetol ensure quality oocytes. Next slide, please. So it acts by or alter the LH FSH uh, uh, ratio by regulating GnRH pulse, uh, pulsatility, and it, it improves insulin sensitivity. <clears throat> by acting as a secondary messenger for insulin action in the peripheral tissues. It brings down plasma levels of insulin and it improves ovulation and oocyte quality by acting as a secondary messenger for FSH. Next slide, please. <coughs> it restores the cycles faster. This is the benefit of uh, myonicetol. 88% uh, uh, patients restored spontaneous menstrual cycle during the treatment. 72% maintained normal ovulatory activity during the follow-up period. And more than 30% of the patients established normal ovarian rhythm through uh, the 16-week uh, treatment period. Next slide, please. And it was seen that in uh, hyperandrogenism, 73% reduction in free testosterone level was seen. 92% had increased uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the sex hormone binding globulins, and therefore pre testosterone was reduced. Next slide, please. We can see how it, uh, the 65% reduction in high levels of insulin levels have been seen by the HOMA index also. You see that the area under the curve is decreased. Next slide, please. Now, clinical evidences, we see some of the studies that have been done for myonicetron. Next slide. So there were more than 39,000 papers published. Next, uh, next slide, please. It's up till 2000. And here you can see the endocrine clinical um, uh, inositol administration in polycystic ovarian disease, where there was a randomized trial done of 50 overweight PCOS patients. In group A, my inositol, two gram per day was given, with pol and group B, only folic acid, 200 milligrams as a placebo. The duration of the, uh, the study was for 12 weeks. Next slide, please. Here they saw that my inositol uh, decreases both insulin and BMI from the uh, baseline you can see. Next slide, please. <clears throat> After 12 weeks of administration, insulin sensitivity and HOMA index is uh, significantly improved. The plasma insulin level goes down. We can see the improvement uh, uh, of HOMA reduction by 56%. So that is a very good achievement. Next slide, please. The home assessment model of assessment, that is the HOMA index insulin resistance is uh, tested by that, is uh, used to predict the relationship between the beta cell deficiency and insulin resistance. HOMA IR is equal to glucose, plasma glucose into insulin divided by 405. Normal HOMA uh, insulin resistance is less than three. And the HOMA insulin resistance more than 2.5 is considered a reasonable indi uh, indicator of insulin resistance. Next slide, please. So this study has shown that myonicetol administration affects hyperinsulinemia and hormonal parameters in overweight patients with PCOS. Next slide, please. So in this study, uh, they have shown that the metabolic and hormonal effects of myonicetol in PCOS patients was affected. Here they had seen that the area under the curve of the insulin was reduced from uh, nine to, from nine to eight had come down to 1.62, so the, 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 this, uh, the plasma glucose levels had gone down because of the effect of inositol. Next slide, please. Here you can see that there was a reduction of 65% in the testosterone levels, and 69% patients ovulated only with myonositol treatment, 
there was a, you can see there's a 65 and 69% ovulated with minocetone and 65% reduction in total in free testosterone was seen. Next slide, please. And in those uh, they were, uh, who conceived, it was seen 90% of pregnancies with fetal heartbeat was seen. Here it has, you see, the, uh, with, you can see with other, it had, they have compared with other drugs, but here with ionisetol, you had shown in 90% of patients, the patients had a pregnancy with cardiac activity. Next slide, please. Minocetol offers better clinical pregnancy rate and delivery rate as compared to placebos. And for placebo, they give uh, you know, folic acid, 200 milligrams, and the minocetol was given in uh, a four gram dose, and uh, even two gram doses were seen to help. Next slide, please. The minocetol shows signs of improvement in metabolic characters also. Like here, you can see when the, uh, you can, they compared it with the placebo, the systolic blood pressure reduced from baseline 131 to 127 after treatment. Diastolic blood pressure from 88 to 82. Triglycerides from 195 to 95. And at the total cholesterol went down from 210 to 170. Whereas in the placebo group, you can see there was no uh, difference. Rather, it was high uh, the cholesterol was concerned. Next slide, please. So minocetol in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome and uh, for induction of ovulation, they, they had seen that the baseline and after minocetol, the serum progesterone levels went up from uh, uh, 1.8 to 10.5. Serum total testosterone, 95, reduced to 45.2. And serum free testosterone, one was there when it was in the baseline, when it went down to 0.38 when it was treated with inositol. And the serum androstenedione, from 230, it went down to 205. So this was a tremendous improvement. And they did study with the FSH, LH levels, and TSH, as well as prolactin also. Next slide, please. So ovulation induction with minocetol alone and combination with plumpin citrate in PCOS syndrome patients with insulin resistance, they uh, saw this pregnancy that uh, the 47 and ovulatory PCOS patients were taken. And in that ovulation occurred in 29%. And in the, in the resistant type, there was a 38.3% uh, reduction. So in, that, uh, in this group in which it ovulated, they had 11 pregnant patients. That means that was 23.4%. And the non-pregnant patients were 38.3%. Next slide, please. Minocetol as a safe and alternative, uh, alternative approach to the treatment of infertile PCOS women has been seen in this study. And the conclusion was that minocetol is not only an effective alternative in the treatment of PCOS patients, but also a secure one as no side effects could be observed in the standard dosage of programs. Next slide, please. So here there was another study here uh, which showed that uh, uh, ovulation in the group one of permethrin citrate only those with clomiphene citrate and NAC, and in the in, in insulin resistant group and the non insulin group. So, there you, they saw that the number of the insulin resistance was 260, and it came uh, it was in the non insulin resistant group was 210. Ovulation occurred in 129, whereas in the non insulin resistant group it was 116. Serum E2 in picograms was 468, and it was 452 in the uh, uh, non-insulin resistant group. Serum progesterone was 7.3 and it were in the insulin resistant group, whereas it was so only 6.4 in the non-resistant group. Endometrial thickness was 8.9 and uh, in the insulin resistant type and 6.4 in the non-insulin -res resistant type. The pregnancy rates which mattered were 30 uh, in, in the insulin resistant, whereas in the non-insulin resistant, it was 24. Next slide, please. So full, full fertility investigations, assessment of insulin resistance, if overweight, lifestyle changes have to be done, the reactive surgery where it is more than, uh, the BMI is more than 40, then you get an ovulation. If it is detected, then you uh, 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 then there's no need of clomiphene citrate. But if when clomiphene citrate and or letrozole can be given if the, there is no ovulation or if the BMI is, uh, um, or if BMI is not satisfactory. Ovulation induction does not occur. You have to use the clomiphene citrate drugs. Then if ovulation is detected in uh, C6 to 9 cycles, if not pregnant, 
IVF is advised. Gonadotropin or CC plus metformin or laparoscopic ovarian diatomy where needed as a last resort, as a second line treatment. Uh, if, uh, if there's ovulation detected, then you go with, uh, you give six cycles. If not pregnant, IVF is advised. And IVF uh, in GNRH, uh, whenever you have to do that, it is usually an antagonist cycle because there are less chances of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation and HMG also may be used. So if there's no pregnancy, then you finally go over to these protocols, the long and short option protocols. Next slide, please. So to conclude, at the end of the treatment, of follicles of uh, diameter more than 15 uh, mm were visible at ultrasound. The, pick up, the number of oocytes recovered at the time of pickup were found to be significantly greater and um, in the group treated with myonositol. So as the average number of embryos transferred and the embryo grade one, they were increased, right. significantly reduced was the average number of immature oocytes, vesicles, germ, and degenerated oocytes too, because it helps in increasing the uh, quality of food sites. So the number of pregnancies are and embryos are more. Next slide, please. It improves the oocyte quality and maturation. Myonositol plays a key role in nuclear and cytoplasmic oocyte development. Higher concentration of myonositol in follicular fluid is a marker of good quality oocytes. Next slide, please. It improves both the fertility and the number of mature oocytes. Significant reduction in the number of immature oocytes reduces the uh, recombinant FSH dosage by 400 international units. So that it is, makes it more cost effective and reduces the chances of OHSs, reduces the number of wasted IVF cycles. Next slide, please. So myonistrol can be evaluated as the best method of ovulation induction for PCOS. And myonistrol treatment should be routinely introduced in IVF protocols according to the American Society for Reproductive Medicine of 2012. Next slide, please. And PCOS, uh, uh, myonistrol supplementation is well tolerated and safe both in obese and lean PCOD patients. The side effects when present are mild and mainly gastrointestinal like nausea, flatulence, and diarrhea. Not only it, uh, it increases the satisfactory pregnancy rates are there and, and it is, uh, reduces the chances of neural tubal defects also, and improvement in gestational diabetes is also being seen. Next slide, please. So finally, the duration of treatment for eight weeks was given in the study in which they uh, looked at uh, the passing glucose, the passing insulin levels, the HOMA IR. And they found that myonisitol supplementation is a simple and safe step in the treatment of gestational shin diabetes. There were pre-treatment and post-treatment. You can see the changes from the passing glucose level from 5.5 to 4.6, the passing insulin from 31.2 to 19, and the HOMA IR index was 6.9 uh, 6 in the pre-treatment group to 3.5 in the post-treatment group. Next slide, please. The myonositol acts by decreasing the insulin resistance. It improves the glucose utilization, improves pregnancy rates, restores menstrual and normal ovulation, reduces pre-testosterone, and improves the insulin sensitivity. So basically, it treats hyperandrogenemia and the uh, insulin resistance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in the... Uh, when the comprehensive management of PCOS requires a patient-centered approach, significant time dedicated to education and counseling. You have to treat them by not only by drugs, but first you have to counsel them, educate them that this is your lifestyle uh, change management only will help you. And in, along with that, if you do not take care of your own wage, your next generation, the coming fetus also, will be a patient of PCOS. And in the long run, your own life will be plagued with the uh, high incidence of morbidity and mortality because of ovarian uh, and endometrial carcinoma or because of um, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular diseases, and type 2 diabetes. So significant time dedicated through education and counseling, remaining up to date on the newest advances in the literature and improvement in health of the PCOS women in pregnancy would help prevent disease in the next generation. Next slide, please. The loss uh, and uh, weight loss should be recommended prior to initiation of any therapy. Ovulation induction should not be started without reducing the patient's weight to the optimum level. 
because it is uh, you won't get a good yield. And hyperandrogenism, hyperinsulinemia should be looked at uh, for uh, uh, for uh, the treatment before ovulation inducing agents and adjuvants should be customized. PCOS patient is the most difficult to treat in IVF. Cycle cancellation rates and risk of OHSS are higher. Fine tailoring of ovarian stimulation protocols is necessary to avoid complications. Treating physicians should be aware of the difficulties and remedies and solutions. Next slide, please. That is PCOS, you have to prepare and assist the women by, uh, and then communicate to the women what they should do, what they should eat, how they should change their lifestyle, and they should overcome the weight and their health risk. They should be aware of that, and we have to support them in it with treatment. Thank you so much for a patient here. Thank you so much, ma'am, for providing this uh, information on PCOS. And uh, we could not uh, give the introduction of uh, our speaker. So, so uh, Dr. Kumedini Ashja uh, is one of the fa famous uh, gynecologists uh, in Darbanga. And uh, she is a clinical secretary of Darbanga Obstetric and Gynecology Society. And Mem has also published many, many articles in international journals. And ma'am, uh, thank you so much for uh, attending uh, our digital platform Shield Connect and giving this information on PCOS uh, in this pandemic situation and helping all the participants to understand the PCOS. And <laughs> I also thank uh, my uh, colleague and uh, who helped me in uh, uh, making this uh, webinar possible, uh, Sajita. And, uh, uh, let me see if uh, I have any uh, question in the comment section. Uh, one minute, ma'am. <coughs> So there is one question that is there any way to treat PCOS patient with LH antagonist? Uh, well, it is not only the LH which is at fault, so mm. we cannot, that is because of the high pulsatility and uh, frequency and amplitude of the GNR um, uh, 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 because of the GNR uh, uh, at the hypothalamic level. Now, if you do only the treatment of LH, that is one portion of it. So, um, simply by reducing the LH, of course, we give antagonists during the uh, ovulation induction cycles because we do not want the premature LH surges to spoil mm -hmm. uh, your uh, dominant follicle and uh, do cancellation of the cycle. So the, that is one part of the treatment. But the holistic approach is that you have to treat the insulin resistance with uh, drugs like uh, uh, metformin and ionisitol. And mm -hmm. um, uh, the ovulation induction drugs have to be tailored according to each patient. There's no blanket treatment for it. And <coughs> Uh, there is one more question that uh, uh, what type of milk uh, can a PCOS patient can have? Like two days, uh, there are lots of uh, kind of meals, skim milk, toned milk. So is there any approach for milk body, body. in diet? Uh, uh, in diet? Yeah. Yes, type yes, of yes. milk. Huh? Excuse me? Type of milk. milk type milk. of milk. Yes. That should be low fat milk. And mm -hmm. uh, you have many types of, you have absolutely fat-free milk, toned milk. Mm -hmm. So those things have to be taken. Don't take uh, the ones which have high fat content in them. And the best thing is whatever mm -hmm. the, uh, the calories that you're uh, ingesting, they have to be expended. They have to be expended with uh, a proper willpower has to be there that you have to reduce. You have to cut down on this much of weight. So take high protein diet. You can have uh, milk if you want to have, you can have it like paneer. Yes. You can have cheese. You can have uh, soya uh, protein. Okay. But uh, uh, milk should always be fat free. And whatever you are taking, that has that much energy has to be expended so that you don't accumulate it in the form of uh, the fat. Otherwise, no amount of ovulation reduction drugs are going to help. First, the first line of treatment is you have to reduce your BMI. In uh, mm -hmm. abroad, uh, people who have um, a high BMI are not recruited in these uh, ovulation induction protocols itself. So the first uh, treatment uh, line is to lifestyle do uh, lifestyle management. Okay. 
so uh, for exercise like uh, does the patient have to do high intensity exercise yes, or yes, moderate level 150 150 uh, minutes of at least you have to have intensive uh, weight bearing exercises intensive exercises <laughs> and at least a 30 minute brisk walk has to be done daily on a five day say no one week at least five days in a week you should uh, put the weight that much time for it and that should be done religiously so thank you so much for uh, providing uh, all the answers to the questions and we are glad to have you every time on this uh, digital platform thank you, so much. <laughs> thank you thank you so much and uh, thank you participants for joining us today and i also thank uh, my colleague sajita for uh, making this uh, possible thank webinar you, sajita, for the slide thank you thank you ma'am thank, thank you so much ma'am bye bye